Welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Wednesdays where we can sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things we found going on in the world of Linux, open source, and pretty much anything else that we find interesting. I'm Vin, that's Joe, that's Pedro, and everyone watching us live on Twitch now with a functioning relay bot. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Still, uh, we were covering in the pre-show. No idea why it's in, in italics on the video version. I'll, I'll look into that. I'll research it. I'll see what I can come up with. But... We had a lot to talk about this week. Uh, we are, I promise you, we're gonna we're, we're gonna have some questions about Firefox and Mozilla. But everything that we're gonna say is gonna come from a place of love. I promise you that. I reviewed a new capture card. Gonna be talking about that. And um, well, you know what? You know what? Paint needs Electron. Microsoft Paint yeah. Electron. <laughs> I think that it, it's. <laughs> I love living in this weird, weird moon, moon future, man. Uh, okay. So what's been going on since last week? Like with me, I've been soldering XLR cables. Look at that. I'm trying to talk Pedro into doing it. Like, ah. Oh. I still think it's unnecessary. No, man. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really brings out the lower, upper, bottom, mid, and highs on Tuesdays. <laughs> Ah, so you're saying uh, there's a preamp if I route the cable <laughs> No, man. Um, through the arm. <laughs> it, 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 helps, it helps reflect cosmic ignorance. When, ah, okay. Yeah. All right. So there's less noise. So it's a perceived increase without actually changing anything. Right. Okay. It's one of those things. I basically uh, <laughs> did it as an excuse to play around with my TS-100, which, um, you know, I wrote on Twitter. Like, here's a odd thing to type. I just updated the firmware in my soldering iron. Okay, whatever. <laughs> strange times, strange times. Um, <laughs> then earlier in the week, I got in an argument with the creator of App Images, so stick around. Stick around for the feedback segment, and we're going to get into that. But Jill is, once again, going back to Disneyland. Yay! Yay! <laughs> so me and us, I'm so excited. Me and Steve husband are going, yes, back to Disneyland, uh, actually for the next several days. One for the Halloween after hours event, Oogie Boogie Bash. So that'll be a lot of fun. And to actually start using our Disneyland annual passes we have called Magic Keys. They're awesome. So I got to take advantage of that so that all that money I spent comes to good use. <laughs> and this is our staycation uh, vacations for the year is going to Disneyland. <laughs> well, I hope you have a good time with it, but let's yeah. go ahead and jump into our favorite Mozilla news. Um, our favorite project, Pedro <laughs> Mateus. Uh, favorite. Yes. Lots of favorites in this one. We absolutely <laughs> love on the show. Can't get enough of is snap and to a lesser extent flat bikes, but there's been a feature freeze exception seating the official Firefox snap and Ubuntu desktop. It's a real thing. This is going to happen. Not for everything, but Ubuntu uh, 2110, when you launch Firefox, mm -hmm. you're like, why isn't it launching? Then it shows up. Uh, <laughs> behold the power of Snap. <laughs> you know, they, on the Ubuntu discourse, they've gone through and they've said things, you know, just trying to answer all the questions that you may or may not have about why the change was made and, you know, can you test it out? What's going to happen? You know, they bring up things like, you know, this Snap is going to be uh, providing cross-platform support, kind of like the uh, binary packages distributed by Mozilla. But um, one of my favorite ones was, is it going to be slow? Followed by <laughs> long answer, short, and then there was like a little paragraph. Shorter than that, yes, it will be. Um, such is the problem. <laughs> they say, we don't want it to be, which uh. very much means, yes, yes, it will be. <laughs> well... <laughs> You know what? You know what? I'm, I'm going to adult. I'm not going to participate in the snap. I, you know, just hate trading. Uh, I am kind of tuckered out. Uh, you can make, you can really make an argument, kind of convince me for using snaps, flat packs and stuff like that for IOT server side stuff. But I'm still not going to try to pretend that they make any bit of sense on the desktop, Pedro. No, mm -hmm. no, they really don't. And yes, theoretically speaking, snaps can work in all distros. But at this point, I'm willing to bet that uh, there are more distributions that support snaps by default, uh, that support debs by default, than there are distros that support snaps by default. It, there's 
just more. So your claims of multi-platform, you're actually uh, reducing the amount of distros that actively support that. And uh, the... The, the, they do have one of the, I think it's the last question in the FAQ is, after the transition, do I have to use the Snap? We, Mozilla and the desktop team for Ubuntu, recommend the Snap, but if you'd prefer otherwise, Mozilla still offers the distro agnostic builds for AMD64 and i386, which means, yes, uh, the uh, only version that will be available in the Ubuntu repos is going to be the Snap. So... That's it. That That's the only option you're given. If you don't want to, go to the Firefox website and install it. Did you not get the <laughs> the reception that Snaps have when you did this with Chromium? Canonical? Fire uh, or Mozilla, as apparently this was Mozilla's idea, as far as Canonical is trying to... Um, push this. No, no, no. They came to us. They wanted this. So, Really? This, yes, really. This Did, is, didn't you read it? Yeah. It's right there on the page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, at this point, I already stopped using Firefox as my main browser. I don't, at this point, I, 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 I don't know. I. Hmm. <sighs> well, I think it's wonderful that Mozilla and Ubuntu are collaborating, and you know this should really help the transition be more seamless than the Chromium Snap was. So, you know, I think they'll get the bugs ironed out really quick and get the speed increased. And, uh, but what's cool is the Firefox tar.bz2 build, you know, I've actually been using for years on my newer and older machines, both 32-bit and and 64-bit. They'll still be around, like Pedro was saying. You could still go to the Mozilla website and download uh, Firefox for any distro. And, um, you know, Firefox is also available as a flat pack and an older version of, of uh, an app image. So if you prefer flat packs or app images over snaps, uh, feel free to use that version of Firefox or just go to the Mozilla website. Well, that, that's the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, if you don't want to use yeah. it, don't use it. Um, yeah. One of the things I, you know, ended up moving from everything in the studio from Ubuntu over to Debian was I didn't like, you know, step two after installing Ubuntu was de Ubuntuing it, taking out things like Snap and all the others. So I'm like, why, why don't you just go straight to the source? But, you know, even Pope brought up the, uh, it's like, uh, there just wasn't a lot of love and attention being done, you know, addressing things like Snap on the desktop and startup speeds mm -hmm. and things that need to be done to improve it. But Hey, you know what? I hope it gets there. I hope people don't have an issue with it. And if you're on Ubuntu, you probably won't notice anything other than why is Firefox taking a minute to start up? It really <laughs> won't be that bad the second and third time, but mm -hmm. there's yeah. your reason. But this next thing, this next thing. That's not the only questionable thing that Mozilla did this week. Mm hmm. No, sir. <laughs> no, <laughs> because you can't go. You can't just Aww. have the one, can you? You can never just have the one. So now there's a new Firefox experiment. Good and news, what are they everybody. doing? <laughs> They're replacing everyone's default search engine, or not everyone's. One percent of uh, the desktop um, users will have their search engine default changed to Bing. Yay! Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Bing? I mean, the snaps, okay. A lot of people <laughs> seem to really like snaps. It's weird that they all seem to work for or used to uh, at one point work for Canonical. But there's some people who do seem to see the point in snaps. This, this I don't. This, it's, okay. Are you edging your bets? Are you actively trying to kill Firefox? I, if you, this is about just having a different search engine, why did you not use DuckDuckGo instead? Is Microsoft paying you money? What are you doing? Probably trying to <laughs> diversify or experiment diversifying their revenue streams because, yeah. you know, like it or not, <laughs> Mozilla, as it currently stands, when you look at the financial breakdown, they exist uh, on Alphabet's whim. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll keep allowing that. But then again, Google's not going to let anything happen to it because, hey, antitrust and all that fun stuff. 
And yeah, and the, the search contract is their, their, their biggest form of revenue, so it makes sense. That is a thing. But I want everyone, if you're currently using Firefox, I use Firefox, and but I use everything. I, I can't, you know, I'm not that. I only use this, I but I use Chrome. I use, Chrome, <laughs> yeah, I use Vivaldi. And, uh, but I want you to head over to, um, just type in about studies, about colon mm-hmm. studies. <laughs> you might be in for a little bit of surprise, you know, uh, Pedro, you made a point that you were not in this experiment, nor was I, no. but I was in two other experiments. <laughs> you guys found out. <laughs> I, apparently I was in three others that I had no idea about. It's like, mm. ah, that feels a bit icky. That does oh. feel a bit icky. <laughs> it was a very real, like, oh, really? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me dis it, which again, I don't mind if I, I don't remember ever opting into these. That's, that's the whole thing. I don't mind, you know, contributing some user data and stuff like that to any project. Just let me know. But <laughs> what's the real end game yeah. here? Uh, because you know, doing something like this is going to cause the internet to be the internet, right? We're doing it. <laughs> oh, panic. <laughs> there's, there's definitely some of that. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, maybe it is just as simple. I mean, but, do Firefox's credit. I mean, you can always easily, easily switch the um, search engines. Yeah. Yeah. And me personally, I actually honestly don't use the Firefox browser address bar to search. I know I might be unusual <laughs> in that way because I, I just have never gotten to the habit of using the address bar. So I just automatically have it have it uh, launched to my favorite uh search engines like DuckDuckGo or front page. And so that's what I use from the web page. I always forget about the launch bar. <laughs> I'm at the address bar <laughs> for search. <It's, laughs> I, it, it could be convenient. like, the, as I'm sitting here <laughs> thinking about the whys, is that the whole, oh yeah, bl- m- most technical people use Firefox because of the olden times and they feel like, oh, because it is the one browser that actually adheres to the web standards and all that. So if we change 1%, will we see like most of those people Mm -hmm. immediately go back to another one? Is that what they're looking at to see Mm. that metric for something that they may be doing for the future? We don't know. That's the big one. We don't know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it's strange though, isn't it? I mean, it's weird. Two questionable decisions in one week. Firefox isn't doing too well, Mozilla. What are you doing? <laughs> we all love Firefox. And, you know, I, I've said it on this show Aww. several times. Just focus on your core competency, which is like make the browser the browser and make make it more awesome, more better. So I got a little something I talked about it last week on the show. And that that's capture card. You might might have noticed nice. we do a little bit of audio and video stuff here. So just a little bit. And <laughs> just slightly. <laughs> which is strange. What are you know? talking about? Audio doesn't work on Linux. Not even a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I need to update my Twitter thing in the background. I want to do the SpongeBob Bob text with a bunch of arrows that says audio doesn't work on Linux. Um, I thought that would be funny. I got my hands on, and by got my hands on, I just went straight out and bought one. The uh, EVGA XR1 Lite. It's, it's like the little baby version of uh, what Pedro has. And by baby version, I mean, it, it's pared down. You know, it doesn't have external audio, 3.5 millimeter audio jacks. doesn't have like the garish red knob to turn and it doesn't blink. I see all no, these. No RGBs on that yeah. one. Definite lack of RGBs. <laughs> Absolute win. But I, I put it through the paces and I stacked it up against, hey, a free option. If you're doing PC to PC capture like NDI and I put it up against a uh, Blackmagic Decklink Mini 4K. That's like a $200 option. Why am I talking about prices? Because you can get this thing for under 70 bucks. That's the big selling point for it. And what do you have at the end of the day? At the end of the day, you do have a capture card that'll do 1080p 60 and 4K pass through. I tested that in the video as well. Head over to linuxemcast.com if you're listening. Give it a watch. And this brings real competition to things like the Elgato Cam Link 4K, which is still over 100 bucks. And does and you know that until then it was like a reliable cheap way to get 1080p cap 1080p 60 capture on linux but you know you don't have the ability to do uhd 30 like you do with the cam link but you get that 4k pass through and that's what most people want anyway at least in my humble opinion plug and play support 
nothing to mess around with. You plug it in, it starts working, and uh, yeah, the capture's good. It's solid. I can bounce over in the uh, video if you're watching that. I'm sure that looks real good watching a video through a video through a stream. Yeah, um, it, that <laughs> looks extra crunchy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's everything. And, you know, I walk through it. There's screenshots, and I got some high-res photos down here if you want to uh, take a look. At all of that, and there's a PCB beauty shot. If you're curious, uh, place spot the test pads. They just keep coming the longer you stare at it. And uh, <laughs> $69.99. I'll give it a solid 4.75 out of 5. That's just no a good necessary one. way to get the audio out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like really the Which only is, con. Yeah. yeah. The, but it, is it really worth it to pay another $50 on top of that to get the original XR1 that has the three and a half mil jacks down the side? Not if I got to put up with that sparkly nonsense and the ugly nonsense. <laughs> you mean this one? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one sparkles and the one, the EVGA XR1 has a wave in it. It so does. It, th- yes. They're, <laughs> they're happy. Well, Pedro, I want you to take that one apart. Um, because I, during the deboxing segment of this video, I, I, I discovered that, have you seen the heat sink on this thing? I never took that one apart, so no. <laughs> but mm. yeah, I saw the video with yours. Uh, it's like, oh, that's a solid chunk of aluminum right there. Steel, <laughs> baby. Come on, aluminum would have been expensive. Oh, it's steel. Okay. Yeah, that, right. that, that, the plate <laughs> is in there to add weight. There is a chunk, chunk <laughs> in the middle. And I initially took the case off and I'm like, wow, this thing must get hot. And then I'm not going to say, well, that's not touching anything. Oh, okay. All right. That's, that's why it had such a nice weighty feel to it. Is that, is the case on that one just all plastic? Mm. Uh, yes. Okay. Same <laughs> with that. There's nothing wrong with it. Again, for the price point, you cannot go wrong uh, for 1080p60 capture. It's USB three works out of the box. Didn't have any problems with it. Uh, for this price, this is the one I'd recommend if uh, it's about the cheapest option that, you know, and I know, I know, because, uh, you know, like two years ago, I did a video on one that was like 70 bucks from, you know, just a no-name AliExpress one. But those come and go, and you can never be guaranteed, you know, because I also did another video earlier this year of one that wasn't even USB 3, even though it had a blue <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> USB blue. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at least with the EVGA model, you will know that um, you're going to be getting a consistent product and there's going to be a warranty and support and everything on that. Also, EVGA, thanks for the retweet. LGC cares. <laughs> um, <laughs> tell me about making Debs. Ooh, this is exciting. So this is make dev. It takes Arch PKG build files and creates Debian packages installable with apt. Awesome. And for all, all, all the people listening who don't know what a PKG build is, it is a shell script containing the build information required by Arch Linux packages. Awesome. So all you have to do is, after you install it, is do make deb tack install and whatever program you want. I did handbrake as an example. And this creates a Debian package. And then you just sudo apt install uh, the... The software and I did sudo apt install handbrake to install it with apt. It was that easy. It it does all the work for you, <laughs> and it, it uh, the handbrake launched beautifully. And what's really cool is this is another project from the creator of Packstall that we talked about in LWW two eighty um, a while ago. Yes. And <laughs> yeah, the Packstall app lets you use the Arch user repository on Ubuntu. And I just wanted to say thank you to the developer, H. Wittenborn, who contacted Strider to bring this awesome project to our attention. Thank you so much. Well, that, that this is, is awesome. Very nice. Can you imagine and yes. being uh, like brave enough to talk to Matthew intentionally? Yeah. <laughs> Actively oh, seeking him, him out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but, no, this is, uh, this is exactly what I asked, uh, is an ability to take the applications that are already in the AUR that you just point at the PKG build and it creates a deb. There. (laughs) There we go. Thank you. (laughs) I'm pretty sure it wasn't because I asked for this, but thank you. That is exactly what I wanted. What's wrong with you? You call yourself a Linux user wanting ease of use? 
<laughs> no, uh, it was more about the not duplication of work because you already have the PKG builds. You you already mm-hmm. know that those work about as well as anything in the AUR does. So, yeah, th- just let me point at that script and have the deb. Mm. The only two debs I make yeah, is... Yeah, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I take that back. I make debs for three things. I make uh, packages for uh, DaVinci Resolve. I make packages yeah, for the kernel DaVinci. when I build it. And I make packages for OBS uh, deb packages when I compile it. But that's just so I can keep track make of Make Resolve deb. <laughs> yes. <And> this <laughs> neat project. But what's the true age of Linux? Ah, Yes, one Ah. of the uh, ultimate questions when it comes to, um, well, uh, the history of Linux. And uh, according to the register, which for some reason that uh, thing was not appearing, (laughs) the, um, let's just put that there. There we go. According to Linus Torvalds, uh, the actual date, at least according to the uh, tar.gz, the first one, not point not one, that was actually released was the 17th of September, 1991. So, uh, uh, Jill's celebratory uh, kudos to another year of Linux a couple of weeks ago, probably a little um, <laughs> early on that one. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but Linus actually has said in the past that there are actually three dates that could be celebrated as, as Linux's birthday. And this is just one of them. <laughs> so there's always this fight in the community. Which one's the real date? You know, the date, the email. He sent that email. It's Big and Gnu. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not like Big and Gnu. And then this where he, he had the original uh, uh, the original uh, early file. And then the mm-hmm. main release that everyone knows, you know, that went out into the public. <laughs> yeah. And uh, th- this all comes because uh, during the latest RC2 window, uh, Linus was talking about all of the things, including the experiment that we mentioned last week or the week before. Oh, you mean the WR? About, uh, That's been fun to watch. WR? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, they're continuing on with that. Just treat all warnings as errors. And uh, apparently that's the, 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 that's been giving uh, people quite a bit to uh, think about. So I look forward to seeing what the actual result will be if they'll just get to go, you know what? Warnings are warnings, errors are errors. We'll just leave it at that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I like that Linus, You know, things were so slow in kernel development that he could focus on these, you know, these little things that need to be fixed. And I love what he says. uh, Who knew I'd still worry about some odd EISA driver on alpha after all these years? Thank you, Linus. You're keeping my deck alpha alive. (laughs) (laughs) Fixing all these little issues, even the older vintage computer ones. Thank you. It's kind of an interesting thing. Um, you know, when he brings that up, he's like, I'm being forced to go back over old and grotty code. You know what? That's not necessarily a bad thing because, hey, you might, <laughs> might you might reconsider things like getting rid of some of that legacy hardware support. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, it won't function like it won't harm the functionality of the uh, set piece. <laughs> uh, see, everyone's okay with getting rid of a 32-bit, uh, 32-bit x86 code, mm-hmm. but when it comes to removing, like, you know, the stuff that all combined all together still sees <laughs> less usage than 32-bit x86, yeah, people seem to have a problem with that. I don't know. I, I've never understood the logic <laughs> behind people getting wound up like, this is my vent. It's nothing new to do with the drill at all. I'm just saying in general, of uh, you know, this is my vintage thing. I'm like, why, why don't you run a period correct operating system on it then? Eh? <laughs> I guess if you are actively trying to use it nowadays, yeah, <laughs> probably one didn't actively maintain anything on it. <laughs> well, you know, you see something like, uh, I'll give a LGR does it right. You know, LGR is not trying to shoehorn windows 10 yes. on a 486. <laughs> It's like yeah. mm-hmm. period appropriate everything. Yes. Right. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, that's how it would run. So I don't know. I just don't understand why people get wound up because they can't run. <laughs> Maybe kernel 515 is not going to work on your tech alpha. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently it will from the yeah. look of things. Yeah. It will. <laughs> yeah. Actually, duck alphas are still used and in I the wild. Add. There's not that many of them out there, but they are out there. <laughs> oh, they're still out there. Most of them are going to be running yeah. HP UX, not Linux. Yeah. This, well, yeah, partly <laughs> I'll just true. Be yes. done with that. Um, so, <laughs> Paint was a little yeah. tiny application that's been around since like the Windows 9X days. And some people are like, hey, I don't miss mm. that at all. Oh, <laughs> well, this is cool. This is uh, JS Paint, but recreated as a cross platform native desktop ass app using Grader. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, yeah, so Greater JS turns a Node JS application into a downloadable cross platform binary. And yes, this is JS Paint. It, it has the similar look and feel to the original Microsoft Paint. And actually, that's kind of a beautiful thing. <laughs> and the, J, the original JS Paint is a web based remake of Microsoft Paint by Isaiah Odnor. And, um, but what's cool is this, this project is, you know, rewrapping that in, uh, with greater, which is really cool. So you can just launch it from your desktop, which is really nice. Pedro, and, I mean, I've kind yeah. of like looked into this, like greater is his own uh, flavor of uh, electron that does some dependency fetching basically. It's yeah. JavaScript, uh, yeah. specifically JavaScript. It's basically so you can, uh, it's a framework for you to develop your JavaScript GUI applications, which wouldn't you know, <laughs> let's, uh, let's recreate something in JavaScript. What are we doing? Paint. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <Yeah. laughs> I guess since Microsoft hasn't, um, they open source the, they actually opened the source for, uh, MS paint. But it still doesn't work on Linux, which I'm very disappointed with the uh, Linuxy people in that GitHub repo. Just get it working. Come on, you can do it. But yeah. uh, this one, <laughs> it it looked very clever. Uh, I downloaded it. I made the executable, mm -hmm. well, the executable, and launched it. And I wouldn't have been able to tell that it was an Electron app if it weren't for the little Chrome thing that showed up. It's like, would you like to translate this to Portuguese? It's like, hey. <laughs> gotcha. So yes, no, it very good job. It does a very good job. Just a uh, Chrome embedded framework window shows up and it looks exactly like paint and it offers to translate mm -hmm. it for you. So there you go. <laughs> My immediate thoughts with this is when we think about the original, you know, nine X series of um, Microsoft paint, you know, strip down that that's about 300 K 300, 300 K worth mm -hmm. of code. about what 20 miles yeah. <laughs> yeah no the download yeah. is uh, exponentially larger <laughs> <laughs> the uh let's see i actually have the thing still here so but dear but dear but dear launched oh, 24 oh, and i was megabytes? happy that <laughs> yeah 24 i was happy that the developer um has a 30 a 32 bit linux executable of js paint as well i think that was really cool i launched it on one of my old computers <laughs> It's uh, interesting. I just thought I'd brought it, bring it up, man. It's, okay, that's the thing. And, you know, uh, this project's author is very clear. It's like, don't D DMCA me, bro. Oh, um. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Again, the, the source code for the original paint is open. Mm -hmm. So uh, Linuxy people, please, someone get on it, get it to work. Can we, can we put but this? But if you don't, well, there's, there's an alternative. Can, can we put this in a snap? <laughs> <laughs> you could <laughs> then, then it's I already a framework within a framework <laughs> yeah. within a framework well, after yeah, that we've reached inception at that well, point once we got that we can throw it in docker right <laughs> you can yeah mm. we can live that life just have the docker system run the entire snap thing <laughs> just <to> run yeah <laughs> <laughs> well what's actually you know what kind of neat is that the developer of this i5 ik who wrapped this in greater um, the or, original uh, JS paint project, they had tried to make their own electron uh, app of it. And I guess it didn't turn out too well. So this you one could imagine like halfway awesome. through the development of like, <laughs> JS paint, it's going to hit you. Like, what am I doing with my life? Um, 
<laughs> but then you look at what you've already done. It's like, well, this is almost finished. So yeah, <laughs> that, that's why we got to get projects like this mentioned because it's just neat. Yeah, you know, and practicality, whatever. Yeah. Do you get anything else you want to add to this, Joe? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, what's really cool about JS Paint is that it has a, a lot of fun extras as well. Like it has dark mode and it even has a red theme, which is called a, a cult, <laughs> the occult red theme. I wonder if Fen likes that one. <laughs> we played with it. Pedro's it's the one very with the bright red, red on his watch, not me. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose I do have the um, yeah. cultist. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> find time <laughs> and you can also upload your pictures to imgur which is really really nice so there's mm -hmm. lots of little extra features with js paint that the original ms paint didn't have and that's wonderful <laughs> right on right on you know what else is wonderful you supporting everything we do keep us loud live <laughs> and independent yours. yeah thank you for that if you want to join that a eclectic bunch of misfits you can head over to patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast and join our uh, not cult. It's not a cult, Pedro. <laughs> it's it's totally not a cult. What are you talking about? <laughs> Listen, man. <laughs> These aren't wizard hoods in, on my chair or anything. No, no, just don't pay attention to I them. would hope not. Aww. Thank you, Isha. We, <laughs> we have red in our lower thirds, Ben. <laughs> that makes us a cult. How long did that take? <laughs> 290 something episodes like that. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think it was the first one but second or third definitely we definitely want to throw it in uh, we got a couple of bonus things for patrons like the video I just finished with the EVGA capture card that's been out for a couple of days so I give everyone a nice early look we got access to our discord super secret discord that we hang out in the other six days of the week that's where fun conversations go down with a uh, Interesting, interesting people. We got a pretty, pretty super shows and we do a bonus hour each and every week in podcast and video format. And if you like this, you like this, this is just the middle, just the middle. There's a beginning and an end to this. We call it the uncut series and that's also available in podcast mm -hmm. form along with a video version. If you get some extra cheddar that you want to kick in our direction, we thank you very much for that. <laughs> Keeping us loud, live, independent, and Yes, see, that's like, mm -hmm. this episode is brought to you by you. And that's really neat. We've been yeah. able to do it like this we love you. for so long. <laughs> you can just head over to LinuxGameCast.com. There's a support button. we got a bunch of different options there, man. Uh, but we appreciate anything you can kick in our direction. Twitch subs and all that fun stuff as well. Now, this is mm -hmm. a big, honking, edible cheese plate. Isn't it? Yes. Mm. <laughs> that Ooh, is a cheesy, a good looking pie. cheesy plate. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that looks like it, it has aspirations to become a deep dish something, doesn't it? Like, I'm yeah, it's kind it. of a, looks like a cheese pizza with maybe some sausage in there. It, it may be the, I, I can see the knuckles of the person, so that's definitely a little zoomed in, but uh, it is, that's still a fairly chalky pizza, that one. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Just in time. For slice of pie. You yes. know how much pizza you can buy for $45 million? <gasps> oh, Quite a bit. In the right? UK, Dang. that's like three. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> so they're getting a cash infusion over at the Raspberry Pi project. I thought this was kind of neat. I wanted to give it a mention because uh, this is something that's kind of important. They have uh, managed to get, uh, what was it? Landzone Partners and Ezra Charitable Trust are going to provide $45 million in additional funding for the Raspberry Pi company as a whole to prevent them from having to go public in order to raise capital, which is fantastic if you have the right partners. And this seems to be the right match because, you know, then all of a sudden you're not caught up in the release cycle of trying to get products out and just selling just everything and at the whims of shareholders and all that fun stuff. And that's not how the Raspberry Pi Foundation has rolled. And this is, I think, pretty much going to allow them to continue rolling like they have been so far. And it's correctly, yep. this is the word you're looking for there. Now, not being beholden to these shareholders, that's going to be a great thing. Not being public, you know, it's work for Steam. It'll probably work for Pi. Short term, an influx of cash like this is going to let them invest more in their supply chain. Mm -hmm. which is really good. And you got to think like long-term, you got that money, you're going to be able to hire new engineers for the next generation of high-powered peripherals. 
which is great because I want a 20 core Raspberry Pi with <laughs> a terabyte of RAM and laser six storage. I, I very much want to keep to see what uh, forty five million dollars or thirty three million pounds gets us when it comes to the company mm. that basically defined the single board computer as we know it today. Because mm. the, if if it's a single board computer, the first thing you're going to compare it to is the Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi four it's very very powerful. There's the eight gigabyte um, model uh, which. We'll give you enough RAM for just about everything you can think of on a Raspberry Pi. So I want to see that improve. I want to see what they can cram into that form factor. I want more Pi. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is awesome because it is the Raspberry Pi is one of the most sold computers in the world. In fact, it it did uh, reach. It was the record holder for that. And I think it still might Mm -hmm. be, especially with the pandemic. (laughs) So this is just awesome. It's going to make it even better. It's going to put desktop Linux, give more opportunity in the hands of the average user. Just so many awesome things about this and just improving the single board computers, everything, everything, being able to you know, utilize it more in the, in different industries. Um, they were saying in the article that it's gotten big and of course an industrial and agricultural. So it's not just the consumer market, but it's the prosumer market that is utilizing the pie as well. It's going to be brilliant. Um, just make sure you stick with that because there's two things you can do. Everything Jill just said, or you can buy your own Island like volcano base Island. So. <laughs> 45 mil? Are you sure that covers the whole island? Hey man, outside of Java, not that I've shopped for this, but I can show you a place. Okay. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, that's going to do it for the Slice Pie. We got a little bit of feedback this week. If you want to shout in our direction, we'd love to hear from you. There's a multitude of ways that you can actually shout in our direction. You can grab us now that the... uh, (laughs) <laughs> yes a kidnapped us uh just uh sit us down at a chair at some venue and dance for us uh but no the best way to actually get in touch is to go to linksgamecast.com you hit the contact button there's a form you gotta fill lwdw is the topic you need to pick for the feedback otherwise we will most likely uh, misinterpret it as some hate mail for the Saturday show. And I do need to throw in, <laughs> no, we no longer accept smoke signals. They're not environmentally um, conscious. So, uh, no. Yeah, no, no. no this is, let's let's try to keep the CO2 levels down. <laughs> we're, we're working really hard to get to re- achieve carbon neutral messaging. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is kind of hard to do when we're talking. There's a lot of carbon dioxide coming out of our mouths. <laughs> That's because you breathe oxygen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amateur. It's mostly nitrogen, but uh, th- there's a lot of oxygen, yeah, too. <laughs> it's got hints <laughs> oh, in it. So, yeah, as I was saying at the beginning of the show, um, last week we talked about a project for App Image that was going to allow it to work more like you would expect a centralized repository like App would work. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Some rando on the internet on Twitter had a problem with it. <laughs> and I was like, what, what, what's going on? That's, uh, I think the day later, I saw things blow up. I'm like, uh, why, why am I getting all these messages? Who's trying to call me? It might be him. What do you think? <laughs> oh, no. Pro bono. <laughs> so, He's calling us. <laughs> using it wrong. Pro bono writes in. Uh, and I just wanted to condense this, kind of put it in. Uh, app images are meant to be downloaded directly from the application author's download page, like EXE for Windows and DMG for Mac OS. For me personally, using a package manager for app images undoes some of their greatest aspects, like not needing the command line, nor a special tool, being able to just download one file that you can copy around wherever you want, and being able to keep multiple versions. All true, all, va- all valid points. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, you oh, know, points. I well, I I, I wrote back. Uh, we there's three people talking about a GitHub project on a podcast, bro. Um, shrug emoji. Um, yeah. I like app images. I I will champion app images over everything. Yes. 
instantly. As far as like agnostic packages go, well, that that's they're the, the best thing. I throw it now. Yeah, if I want to try favorite. before I buy and see an app image, you know, I'm going to try that. And if I like it, I would have put a ring on it. Okay, then we might do an app search and be like, hey, you're floating around. If I really want it, you know, then I'm heading over to your GitHub or wherever. You keep your code and I'm going to build my own copy. But I'm, you know, the evolution of things, you know, saying that you need to use thing X only the way that it was intended to be used is laughable. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's like Ven is saying, it's, it's nice to have another option to find app images. You know, it's very convenient to see what app, app images are available in the terminal, install them and have search capabilities for them. And using app man actually saves me time. <laughs> and this, this is something we talked about in the pre uh, pre chosen with uh, me and Ven and Pedro. One of the complaints Linux users and software developers have of app images is that they didn't have a unified repository like flatbacks or snaps. And now they do. And maybe there will be greater <laughs> adoption because of it. And yeah, app images are the oldest containerized format for installing apps on Linux. Um, and they are, it is my personal favorite as well. I love app images. Portable Linux apps. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for creating app images. <laughs> yeah, it's, we weren't very clear with that. You know, the, this piece of feedback comes from the creator of app images. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 There's rooms for everything, you know, admittedly, I would like to see something like this take off again. You're still not going to mm -hmm. sell me on container. I wouldn't personally use it, but I still would. You know, I, I would use that over installing another system. That's, that's like my big thing, especially yeah. being this mm -hmm. uh, hipster Debian purist. Like, I don't want to install another attack vector to use something. That's how I... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to that point, it's like, yeah, you really don't want to compare app images to Windows EXEs because that's usually how viruses and other malware happens on Windows. So but, but what if I rename it point? .exe? <laughs> you can. You absolutely can. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> if the header is file, uh, if the header uh, of the file is correct, then most applications will go, no, you can call it whatever you want, but what, I know what that I mean, is. Do you not have your own file extensions? Cause I am a big, big proponent of like, you better watch out of my box. Like if you're going to click something dot YOLO. <laughs> but it, I don't know. I genuinely don't know how having a centralized hub to allow people to find all of the app images that are available, how oh, that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's more exposure. You people go to the one place exactly. and they can see all of the app images, maybe even the ones that they didn't even know they wanted. Here it is, Pedro. Too many people start using app images, and it won't be underground. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> are we targeting the hipster crowd? Is oh. that is that what yeah. we're going for? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I mean, we are the, Linux users, yeah. so. I completely get the point where he's coming from. Like, here's the intended point. Yeah. Which is great. Definitely. But this is also Linux, so, hey, we can try this other thing, too. We can and fork you, it. Then you have <laughs> all those uh, old JPEGs of uh, design and, you know, user experience. Mm -hmm. Just because you wanted something to be something else, if people find a use for it that ends up being more useful or more widely used, that's how they're going to do it. And... Well, I brought yeah, up the example it's not a bad thing. <laughs> in the pre-show of, you know, this came came to us via Twitter, which it's like the irony is if you go back and look at what Twitter was created as a micro blogging platform, which didn't even include <laughs> ad replies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it got to where it is today so we can have this conversation because people were using it unintentionally, you know, the whole hashtag thing and all the other yeah. fun stuff. Uh, it, Things evolve, and this is not taking anything away from app images. App images are going to work just like they normally would with everything else. But we want to give people an option of like, hey, man, I really like the app image itself. I like this format. I like this way of doing things. Giving some people you know, to do it from the command line to do a quick search and to pop some things in their box. Everyone's going to be happy. It's, yeah. it's just more. It, it, it's just yeah. another it, way to find the one centralized way for all the app images. That That's great. And, you yeah. know, it's not taking say, anything away from it. Like being able to <laughs> nope. add in versioning control. <laughs> it's adding to yeah. it. <laughs> it, it. It's kind of, 
kind of interesting times. Good to see it. Yeah. And you know, there is actually also appimagehub.com. So mm-hmm. you can do a web search for all the app images <laughs> online. I've been using that for years. And App Man just kind of brings them all together in the terminal. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> and like I said last week, uh, please, I want someone to create Ubuntu or Fedora App Image Edition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please. <laughs> we we could not create awesome. a Fedora App Image Edition because I already know what it would be called. <laughs> Fedorf? <laughs> not even close, Joe. Not even close. But... <laughs> We got to bounce out of here. Thanks for watching. Stick around for your name in the credits. And uh, yeah, let's do this. Do I get a credit button? <laughs> Yay. Thank you to all ah, yes, our beautiful patrons. The fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> Out of all of the uni, uh, universal containerized uh, application distribution methods, or whatever you want to call them, app images are my favorite. I've said it mm-hmm. before and I'll say it again. I like me some app images. Well, I'll boils tolerate down flat to, packs. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, on the desktop, it's like that's true before I buy. It's not how I, it's not the life I'm going to live permanently. Oh. Uh-huh. <laughs> And, you know, it was app images were the first containerized format for Linux and I've been using them for years <laughs> and I, I love them. That's how I that's how I try out uh, new versions of uh, distro of um, applications like Caden Live. And even actually, there's even some distros that <laughs> run as app images. <laughs> yeah. All right. That app attack is over. We will see you next week. Have fun. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Love you all.